Uh, Mr. President, uh, earlier uh, today, this morning on the Senate floor, uh, Senator Durbin called on Republican members to uh, uh, offer to, uh, to give up what he called their, their federal health care. And it uh, heard, his, heard his comments. Uh, you know, he makes an interesting argument. Uh, but once again, Democrats in the Senate are ignoring history, as the Senator did uh, today. Uh, ignoring the facts and ignoring the Democrats' uh, record on this issue. The truth is that Republicans have already offered in this body to give up their health insurance coverage. In fact, here's the rest of the story. Uh, during the debate on the health care law, almost two years ago today, uh, Republicans offered to forego their private coverage and instead enroll all members of Congress, all members of Congress, in Medicaid the government's uh, safety net program for low-income individuals. The Democrats in this body unanimously rejected this idea. Unanimously rejected this idea. Every Democrat, every Democrat voted no. This was on amendment by uh, Senator, former Senator Lemieux from Florida, uh, an amendment that asked to enroll all members of Congress in the Medicaid program. Yet at least 50 percent of the newly covered individuals under the Democrats' new law is going to get coverage. These people will get their coverage through Medicaid. So the President's solution for health care in this country is to put 50 percent of the newly covered individuals under Medicaid, but yet the Democrat members of the United States Senate unanimously voted no. If Democrats believe that Medicaid is good enough for the 24 million people uh, they will soon force onto the rolls, my question is, why isn't it good enough for the Democrat members of Congress? And so I'm joined today by my colleagues on the floor who continue to raise questions about the health care law and the uh, so many broken promises made by this president. Uh, I'm, uh, Fortunate to uh, be joined by the uh, senior, a senior member of the Senate Finance Committee, Senator Grassley. And I would ask my colleague from Iowa, you know, as a senior member of the Senate Finance Committee, you spent a lot of time studying and debating President Obama's health care law. My question to you, Senator Grassley, is do you think that the President's promises match the reality? Senator from Wyoming. Uh, definitely not. And Americans are seeing every day that that isn't the case. If I could respond a little bit more in length, I would go back to 1994 and point out a problem that President Clinton had and that in turn President Obama tried to avoid about 14 uh, years later. Uh, it was in 1994 uh, that the health care reform issue came before the Congress, promoted by President Clinton at that time, and it failed and in a, in a large part because it fundamentally changed the health care coverage for nearly, Ameri for nearly every American. Now, we know that the bill that is now law has fundamentally changed. But President Obama in 2009 and throughout his campaign in 2008 decided that he would combat the failure of the Clinton administration on health care reform and not being successful there uh, by repeating over and over again to Americans, if you like what you have, you can keep it. It's basically what we heard on at least 47 different times through uh, while the bill on health care reform was being debated. Now, we heard that from the president himself. We probably heard it by members of this Congress, uh, you know, hundreds of times. And while it may have been politically useful to make that promise to the American people, Senator Barrasso, it remains a promise that he can't keep and he didn't keep. The fact is that millions of Americans are seeing changes in their existing health plan due to the health reform law. And uh, so basically, when the president says, you, if you like what you have, you can keep it, it's not turning out that way, and Americans are seeing it every day. The administration's regulations governing so-called so grandfather health plans will force most firms and up to 80 percent of the small businesses to give up the current health pr programs, and that's happening fairly regularly. When those businesses lose 
grandfather status, they immediately become subject to costly new mandates and increased premiums that follow. So the economics of health care costs and health care uh, insurance dictate that you aren't going to be able to keep what you have as the President promised. Families in 17 states no longer have access to child-only plans as a result of health law. So if you were a voter in 2008 and the President said to you, uh, you like what you have, you can keep it, and you wanted only health insurance for your children, you can't do that today in these 17 states. It's not known how many families that lost coverage for their children because of the law have been able to find an affordable replacement. In Medicare Advantage, that's about 20 percent of the senior citizens of America. There's a study showing Medicare Advantage enrollment is going to be cut in half. Choices uh, available to seniors are going to be reduced by two-thirds. Then there is the open question about Americans who receive their health care through large employers. The uh, CBO recently released a report that constructed a scenario where as many as 20 million Americans could lose their employer's coverage. And while I acknowledge that the Congressional Budget Office report provided the number that I just mentioned as only one plausible scenario, there are many who believe that that's a very plausible given the incentives in the health care law created for large businesses. So, Senator Bar Barrasso, 47 times. Just while we were debating it, I don't know how many times during the campaign, this president said, if you like what you have, you can keep it. It's a promise that was not kept. Well, and it's interesting, I say to my colleague from Iowa that we, we take a look at this and uh, so many promises. That, that reflects one specific promise, if you like what you have, uh, you can keep it. You know, I practiced orthopedic surgery for 25 years, taking care of families in Wyoming. Many of those families are uh, include family members who are on Medicare, the, the program for our seniors. And and then uh, the Senator, Senator Grassley has made some uh, reference in his uh, in, in the earlier comments about seniors, people that are on Medicare, people that are having a harder time uh, finding a doctor. And and this health care law clearly had an impact on seniors as well. So I would ask uh, my colleague from Iowa, are there specific things that, that you've been hearing as you travel around the state visiting with folks at home uh, in terms of perhaps promises made specifically to seniors and those broken promises related to Medicare? That's not only a promise that's been broken, that's a promise that is very easily to quantify. Because the President said on July the 29th, 2009, during the consideration of this health care reform law, the President said, quote, Medicare is a government program, but don't worry, I'm not going to touch it, end of quote. So let's take a look at the health care law and see if that promise was kept. The health care law made significant cuts in Medicare programs. And this is what you can quantify in dollars and cents. On April the 22nd, 2010, the chief actuary of Medicare analyzed the law and found that it would cut Medicare by $575 billion over 10 years. The president said about Medicare, as I told you, I'm not going to touch it. But the president has touched it in a big way, $575 billion dollars out of Medicare. And that's a, when Medicare is in a road on a path to go broke by 2021. $575 billion isn't going to guarantee Medicare for everybody in the future. We've got to reform and change Medicare if, that's, if that promise is going to be kept. And we all want to do that. But the President has made that more difficult. The Congressional Budget Office wrote that over $500 billion in Medicare reductions would, quote, would not enhance the ability of the government to pay future Medicare benefits, end of quote. And you know what the President said during the debate on this bill? I'm not going to touch it. But he has touched it in a big way. The chief um, actuary had this to say about the Medicare reductions, quote, providers, meaning hospitals, doctors, 
Providers for whom Medicare constitutes a substantive portion of their business could find it difficult to remain profitable and absent legislative in intervention might end their participation in the program. So not only touching it in 500 and some billion dollars, but also touching it in a way of limiting access for senior citizens of America. When the president said, I'm not going to touch it, he misled the American people. The CM actuary said, in essence, these cuts could drive providers from the Medicare program. And I have a hard time to understand how these massive cuts to Medicare count as somehow I'm not going to touch Medicare. On the other hand, the biggest problem facing Medicare in the near, firm, t near term is a physician's payment update problem that we constantly have to address and could have been addressed in the health care reform bill. And you know what? It wasn't addressed. Of course, nothing was done about it. Perhaps that's what the president meant when he said about Medicare, Senator Barrasso, I'm not going to touch it. Well, I think that uh, clearly points out to the people uh, around the country what they, uh, what they know, if, if they're on Medicare, that it is that much more challenging for them uh, uh, to even find a doctor because of the $500 billion of cuts to Medicare, and not to save Medicare, not to strengthen Medicare, but to start a whole new government program for other people. So those are several of the uh, promises that the President made. Uh, we just heard uh, from my colleague from Iowa that if you like what you have, you can keep it. And we know that that promise has been broken. And now the promise is about the President of I will, uh, I will protect Medicare, which is clearly not, not the case, as the American people have seen, which is why this health care law is even more unpopular today than it was uh, when it was passed. But, but thinking back to the time that it was passed, uh, the, the, the senator from Missouri who's joining us on the floor, uh, Senator Blunt, uh, was very actively involved in the debate and the discussions uh, in, uh, in pointing out the concerns that people at home in his home state had with regard to the health care law and the objections that he heard. And, and, and my recollection is that there was even an issue on the ballot about uh, the health care law and, and mandates and, and issues. So, so I would ask my, my friend and colleague uh, from, from Missouri if there are things that he would like to add in uh, to, to help uh, with this discussion of the broken promises of the Obama health care law. Well, Doctor, I thank you for your leadership on this issue during the debate of the health care law itself and right up now on the second anniversary of it being uh, signed into law. And certainly Missouri voters were the first voters that uh, went to the polling place and registered their view of this, which as I recall, it was like 72 percent said, no, we don't want to be part of it. Now, the national number on approval appears to be catching up with that. The, the famous comment that was made on the other side of the building by the speaker, that we'll know what's in the bill once we pass it, has proven to be very true and not very positive from the point of view of, of that bill. And it was uh, you, the, the, the promises that you and Senator Grassley have talked about already, the promise not to touch Medicare, uh, the promise uh, that if you like what you can have, you can keep it. And surely nobody can say that with a straight face anymore. And the promise that there wouldn't be a mandate during the campaign. You know, four years ago, this was the big uh, division between the two principal candidates for the nomination on that side. And uh, uh, Senator Obama's view was that there would be no mandate. There's no need for a mandate. In fact, at one point he said uh, that uh, having a mandate would be uh, like solving homelessness by mandating that everybody buy a house. Now, that's not my quote. That's uh, President Obama's quote when he was Senator Obama. Having a mandate on health care would be like solving the housing problem by saying we're going to require that everybody buy a house. Uh, these, this, this plan does not work. It doesn't come together. The parts of the plan that were supposed to pay for the plan are one by one being discarded. Remember... Uh, Senators, the CLASS Act, the so-called CLASS Act, the Long-Term Care Act, which technically, I guess, would have uh, produced some money because you collected money the first 10 years, the, the 10 years you're counting the money, and you're not allowed to spend any of it for the first 10 years. So sure, that would be a net income to the federal government. You're not spending anything. Everything's coming in. But even the Secretary of uh, Health and Human Services said th what many of us said at the time, this plan won't work. So we're not even going to collect the money because we know that it won't that there's no way this particular structure 
will do what it's supposed to do. So it's just one broken promise after another, one set of, of, of things that the more the American people look at it, they, they realize that this just doesn't add up. Uh, and not only does it not add up financially, it doesn't add up to better health care. We're going to see lots of people... Uh, this, the Congressional Budget Office recently uh, estimated that I think 20 million people that get insurance now at work would lose that insurance at work uh, once this goes into effect. And that was not a calculation in the original bill. Everybody was calculating at least that anybody who has insurance now would keep, would their employer would continue to pay for it. Well, 20 million of them apparently, is that's not going to be the case. And you know, I'd go back uh, to you on, on that topic of just what employers are going to have to decide to do once they're faced with this new mandated policy that covers not what they think they can afford, but whatever some government official decides is the perfect policy for all Americans. Now, imagine that, the perfect policy for all Americans. One size fits all almost always means that one size doesn't fit anybody. Uh, but this perfect policy, and these empl these employers, it's now understood, uh, are in many cases just going to take the option. We'll pay the penalty that's less than we're paying now for insurance, and we'll let our employees, uh, we're going to have to require our employees to go uh, get their insurance in a subsidized exchange, which means taxpayers are helping buy insurance for people that today the employers buy insurance for at the rate of at least $20 million, and I think that number will be a lot higher than that, Senator. Well, it does seem that way to me to the point that now two years out, uh, Senator Coburn and I uh, put together a report uh, on what we're finding. Uh, it's called a checkup on the health, uh, on the federal health law, and, and the title is Warning Side Effects, because there are huge side effects from uh, this health care law. And the, the four that we've written out on the prescription pad, on the, as we see it, as the prescription pad handed out by uh, President Obama, uh, number one is fewer choices. Number two, we have higher taxes. Number three, more government. And, and four is less innovation. That's what the American people are seeing of the side effects of this health care law. Things that they don't want. They don't want fewer choices. People want more choices. People don't want higher taxes. They want lower taxes. They don't want more government. They want less government. Uh, they don't want less innovation. They want more innovation. That's what the American people ask for. What, there was a reason to do health care uh, reform because people wanted the care that they need from a doctor. They wanted a cost they can afford. And, and I, I, I know that's what uh, my colleague from, from Iowa sees when he goes home every weekend and talks to people in his home communities. Could I add one thing at this point? We don't really know how bad this bill is yet, or this law is yet, and I'm going to add something to what Senator Blunt said when you quoted the Speaker of the House saying, we don't really know what's in this bill. You're going to have to pass it to find out what's in it. That's what she had to say to get a majority vote, even of her own party, to get it through the House of Representatives. But in a sense, she's right. You can read every, you could understand every letter of this law, but it has 1,693 delegations of authority for the Secretary to write regulations, mm -hmm. and until they're written, you aren't really going to know what's in it. And you remember the accountable care organization rules that came out uh, six pages out of 2,700 in the bill dealt with accountable care organizations, but the first regulations that were written were 350 pages long. So uh, we really don't know what, how bad this legislation is, maybe for a few years down the road, and hopefully we never get that far down the road. And, and my understanding from the accountable care organization component of this is that the very health programs that the accountable care organizations were, were, were referred to, the ones that the president held up as the models across the country, and one was in Utah, one was Geisinger in Pennsylvania, I believe the Mayo Clinic may have been a third. Once all of those 350 pages of regulations came out, the programs that the president says, this is the model that we want to follow, they all said, we can't comply with these, with these regulations. They're too stringent. They're too confining. They won't work at our program. So if they're not going to work at the kind of places that the president said are doing it well, to me, that means they're not going to work anywhere uh, in, in Wyoming and very likely not anywhere in, in Iowa or anywhere in, in Missouri as we go and try to make sure patients can get the care that they need from the doctor that they want at, the, at, a, at a cost that the, they can afford. 
I mean, those are the things. And that's why I continue to look at this health care law and go home every weekend and talk to people and continue to hear that this bill is bad for patients, bad for providers, the nurses and the doctors who take care of those patients, and bad for taxpayers. Uh, when we take a look at the uh, and, and Senator Blunt made, made a comment about this with the Medicare and, and the, some of the changes. Who's going to make these decisions? It looks to me, uh, from, from reading through this uh, law, that it's uh, unelected bureaucrats, uh, 15 uh, unelected bureaucrats with this uh, so-called independent payment advisory board, uh, people who will decide what hospitals would get paid for providing various services so that in small communities, the hospital may say, well, we can no longer offer that service. Um, you know, I've heard my colleagues talk about the, the specific loss of uh, the, the, the availability of hospitals uh, to even stay pr profitable mm. uh, with, uh, with some of the, the cuts from taking $500 billion away from um, Medicare. Again, not to save and strengthen Medicare, but to start a whole new government program uh, for others. Uh, I mean, those are the things that we're, that we're dealing with and why at town hall meeting after town hall meeting, people continue to tell me they want this repealed and they want it replaced with patient-centered, patient-centered health care, not government-centered, not insurance company-centered, patient-centered health care. That's, that's, what, that's what people are asking for, and they get tired of all of these broken promises uh, that the president has made. You know, I mean, I remember he said he's going to bring down the price of premiums by $2,500 per family per year. What family wouldn't want that? Because the whole purpose of the health care law initially was to get the cost of health care under control. This didn't do that. If I go to a town hall meeting, as I did not too long ago in Wyoming, and say, how many of you under the new health care law are finding that you're paying more for health insurance. Not the $2,500 less a year that the president promised. How many are you paying more? Every hand goes up. And then you ask the question, how many of you believe that the quality and the availability of your own care is going to go down a as a result of this health care law? Every hand goes up. Mm -hmm. And I know in the, in the show me state of Missouri, that's not what people want. They don't want to pay more and get less. And I don't know if my, my colleagues have been hearing things similar to that at home. Well, that's exactly what I, I think we're all hearing. Whether you were for this bill or not, my guess is that you're hearing that if you're asking that question. And, you know, the president's uh, promise, another promise that the average, that the, an average family would, if, if his health care plan uh, went into effect, uh, would have uh, $2,500 less, as you just said, doctor, for, for per year. Uh, in fact, since he became president, uh, insurance premiums have risen uh, by $2,213 a year. Not a $2,500 cut, but a $2,213 increase, according to the Kaiser Family Foundation. The, the survey is that in 2008, employer-provided insurance, the average family premium was $12,860. Uh, last year, it was $15,073. Uh, these are incredible increases for families that, uh, along with the, the bad energy policies and other policies, put families into a condition that they would hope not to be in and we'd hope not for them not to be in. So you've got, you've got increased cost to families, increased cost to the system. That's the other thing the president said. Another broken promise was uh, that this health care bill would control cost. Um, and... Um, Recently, according to the Medicare actuary, the person that calculates these costs, the estimate was that national health spending would go up at least $311 billion over 10 years under this plan. Now, that's not cost control. That's $311 billion, uh, almost a, a third of a trillion dollars in increases. Uh, payment reductions to hospitals. You mentioned this uh, uh, this board that will make these decisions, I'm not sure that there'll be enough people on that board that understand rural hospitals uh, to understand why it's critical that uh, rural hospitals that are critical care hospitals continue to have uh, different arrangements with the government than others do for the government provided health care like Medicare and Medicaid. Um, and if they understand that, there may not be enough people on the board that understand the unique needs of urban hospitals that have a heavily uninsured population. How is this 15-member board going to be better 
uh, than the 500 members that, that serve people in Washington now trying to look at specifics and then be accountable. Who's this board accountable to? Uh, what decision do they make uh, that somebody can challenge in a meaningful way, in a way that they'd be really concerned about? So it doesn't control cost, as, it, as the president said it would. It doesn't reduce insurance costs, as the president said it would. I think it will wind up with maybe even more people uninsured as long as the penalty that you pay is less than uh, the premiums you're going to pay, particularly for young workers who are outside the system today. Uh, in, in the president's plan, uh, you eliminate the advantage that they have for being young and healthy by saying, no, you can't really classify groups where if you go get life insurance, you certainly pay more if you're 75 for life insurance mm -hmm. than if you're 27. If you have, uh, you're just going to pay less. And it's the same way today for, uh, for health insurance as well, because it's clear that the likelihood of your using that plan at uh, 26 is uh, different than it is at 62. Uh, and so all of these things just don't add up. And people are beginning to figure they don't add up. And, and I thought Senator Grassley made a very good point about even when we pass the bill, uh, you won't know all of the cost of this bill till it actually goes into effect. And I, I'm very much in support of his view that we never want to let this get so far down the road we know how much it would really cost or all of the rules and regulations you would really have uh, because uh, it, will, it will head health care in a direction that we might not be able to reverse course and get to a health care uh, system that's really focused on patients and health care providers rather than government bureaucrats deciding what's the best health care for everybody. I want my doctor to decide. I, I want to be part of that discussion. I, I don't want some government bureaucrat deciding what procedure is the only procedure that's acceptable uh, for me. Well, and, and, and it's interesting because I know you go home, uh, as I do, uh, very, very often to talk to many of the uh, uh, small business owners uh, in the state of Missouri, as I do in Wyoming, as uh, Senator Grassley does in Iowa. And uh, one of the promises that the president made is he said uh, four million small businesses may be eligible for tax credits. Four, four million small businesses may be eligible for tax credits. Well, it turns out that uh, the key word there by the president is may, may, may be, be eligible. Uh, even though the fact that the White House had sent out postcards to all these small businesses, the IRS spent over a million dollars in taxpayers' money to send out millions of uh, postcards promoting the tax credit. The Treasury Department's Inspector General recently testified that, quote, uh, the volume of credit claims has been lower than expected. As a matter of fact, only 7 percent of the 4 million firms the administration claimed. Why? Well, because of the complexity and the whole way that the system was set up, the president was able to talk big and deliver very small. And that's why so many people are very, very unhappy with, uh, with the claims uh, in the health care law, because they know that these promises have been broken. And with regard to the uh, uh, Nancy Pelosi's uh, famous quote that uh, first you have to pass it before you get to find out what's in it, that's why I come to the floor every week with a doctor's second opinion, because it does seem that just about every week we learn some new unintended consequence, something new about the health care law, and another reason why Americans are unhappy with it, why it remains uh, as unpopular, if not more unpopular today, as when it was passed, uh, and uh, why so many people believe that, uh, that, this, uh, that the Supreme Court should find this bill un unconstitutional uh, for uh, for the reasons that really do uh, have Americans at home really in an uproar. Very unhappy that uh, the government can come into their homes and mandate that, uh, that they buy a government-approved product uh, and either pay for it or, or pay a fine. Nothing like this has happened before, uh, and people are, are, are frankly offended. Uh, we don't know what the Supreme Court is going to do, but I know what this body ought to do. This body ought to vote to repeal and replace this broken health care law and really get a health care law in place, which is what the American people wanted, which is the care they need from the doctor that they want at, at a price they can afford. And we have not seen that yet, uh, but that's why we are here on the second anniversary of the, uh, the president's health care law 
uh, to continue to point out the flaws of this. And, and quite interestingly, and when you take a look at some of the national poll numbers for people who have talked to a health care provider, whether that be a nurse, a, a doctor, a physician assistant, a physical therapist, a nurse practitioner, no matter who, uh, they are even less supportive of it than the general public. So the Senator that, has used 30 minutes. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I yield the floor.